critiques uh, the, these factors like uh, industrial revolution, the scientific revolution, Christianity, capitalism, patriarchy that has resulted in the death of nature. So, uh, I mean, this is a text that came in the 1980s. Carolyn Merchant was a very influential feminist. So, uh, although um, all of these ideas that I was talking in connection with uh, uh, British and American literature, these criticisms uh, came later, like Roderick Nash, um, Guha, and uh, Carolyn Merchant, Lynn White Jr., all of them were writing in the post 1950s. Um, coming to Ramachandra Guha, Guha has this book called Env Environmentalism, a Global History. Um, this is the book, Environmentalism, a Global History. It's a very simple, easy read, it's about 200 pages, with like big, long, big font and lots of spaces. So it's very easy to read and very informative. So in this book, he talks about the origin and growth of global environmental thought and action. So it is not a, a scientific approach to environment or, you know, it's not a not an account of how much environmental degradation has happened. It is basically looking at the growth of environmentalism across the ages. And um, although it says global history, of course, a 200 page book cannot cover all of the global history, right? It just talks about a few select countries. Um, and of course, he talks about the US and the Indian context. So, um, but then globe in the sense of global history, he also begins from the British and American tradition. And he says that broadly speaking, there are two waves of environmentalism. Uh, please note environmentalism and not eco-criticism. I have not come to eco-criticism yet. I will uh, take a bit more uh, time to reach there. So and, uh, two waves of environmentalism happens first in the 19th century and second in the latter half of the 20th century. So what we looked at so far is uh, 19th century, right? Um, uh, the you know late romantic period and uh, uh, American uh, narratives were all happening in the uh, mid uh, 19th century. Mm. So that uh, so he, uh, he says that that was a clear response to industrialism, and it took three uh, three forms especially in America. So he says that there was this idea of back to the land, going back to the land by, you know, denouncing the city life. So Walden is one such example, going back to the land. But all these people who went to the land, right, as in uh, uh, discarding the city life and going back to the countryside, living in um, huts and living by the pond and doing their own uh, cultivation and you know eating locally and all of that, they need to have some kind of privilege for that, right? You need to have land, you need to have um, the kind of resources and uh, you need who, who can spend all their time in the farm, right? They, um, they need not have to go and work somewhere. So that kind of leisure and privilege was there. Uh, so he says back to the land was one response. Another response was conservatism. Um, sorry, conservation, I'm so sorry. So conservation conservation of forests, forest conservation. We are all familiar with that, um, especially in Kerala. You know, these days we are, uh, there is a lot of human uh, animal conflict that is happening every day. So uh, on the one hand, uh, we need to conserve our forests and, um, you know, our wildlife. Uh, but at the other, on the other hand, you know, there's also the human population. So uh, that's another debate, but that is not what I'm, uh, you know, talking about in this context. Here he says that, uh, uh, you know, the, this comes mostly in the, um, in America, I already talked about the national uh, national parks, right? So that is one example of conservation, how conservation works. It is definitely related to the state policy. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, yeah, so uh, it is also related to colonization and imperialism. So think of the Indian context, you know, when did our forest laws uh, definitely have a colonial baggage? When did these forest laws uh, get formulated, right? Who decided that these are reserve forests that the state can use and, uh, you know, people have to be, um, you know, uh, and there, uh, there will be a, a very clear cut boundary um, uh, within which people should not live, you know, they have to live outside of that and so on. So how do these conservation activities happen? And a very important question from a people's point, sorry, people's point of view, especially the indigenous people's point of view, is the question that whose forest are we conserving or who uh, who are we conserving these forests for, right? So 
in in the co colonial context these forests were definitely conserved being conserved for uh, you know uh, using the trees as timber for building railways for building ship uh, you know and other infrastructure for uh, you know for the maintenance of the colonial uh, power so the the question of conserve, uh, conserving uh, wildlife and wilderness and uh, the intervention of the state is something that one can always uh, uh, look upon and see uh, so many kinds of conflicts related to that. So, um, so conservation was this uh, policy related approach, uh, whereas on the other hand, there was also the preservationists. So John Muir, Aldo Leopold, all of these people were preservationists who said that uh, nature need not, uh, nature need Nature should not be conserved uh, for a utilitarian purpose because that was what the conservationists were talking about. You know, they need timber for building uh, railways and other things. Um, preservationists, as opposed to the conservationists, were talking about preserving uh, the pristine nature uh, just for the sake of it. Because nature has value, nature has um, uh, some kind of a moral uh, presence and it needs to be preserved. So there is this. Uh, slide i mean it might be confusing in the beginning but then if you think about this utilitarian as well as uh, as opposed to the um, the intrinsic value point of view you will get the uh, the distinction between scientific conservation and um, preservation of wilderness so these were the three kind of responses to industrialism that uh, uh, happened in the 19th century according to buha and this uh, constituted the first wave of environmentalism according to him uh, now uh, this was in the 19th century, and the second wave is happening uh, in the second half of the 19th, uh, 20th century, post 1950s. So there is clearly a gap in between. And um, you know, you all uh, are studying history, and you know, uh, in the 20th century, the uh, two wars happened, and you studied modernism and all. So you know, it was a very, very turbulent time. It was a very um, uh, like morally uh, devastating sort of a time. So nobody had time to think about the environment at this time. So, but um, uh, in terms of the mainstream historical narratives, okay. So um, after the Second World War, uh, Guha says that, you know, there was a, he calls this gap as the age of ecological innocence, where uh, nothing much about environment was being discussed until 1962. So why there is this great gap between this, these years and what happened suddenly in 1962 is a question. So 1962 uh, is considered to be a time when the second wave of environmentalism was inaugurated or the modern environmental movement was inaugurated. And what is different about this uh, period is that as opposed to the idea of nature that was you know, nature with a capital N that was prevalent in the previous period in all of those narratives, here you don't you don't talk about nature in that sense at all. Here you talk about the environment. So the transition has already happened, right, from nature to uh, discourses about the environment. So what happened in 1962? A very very important book was published uh, by Rachel Carson. Uh, the book's name is Silent Spring very beautiful book. Um, you should read this, at least if you don't read the entire book, at least read the first chapter. It's very beautiful. It's called A Fable for Tomorrow. Now, this book, uh, I mean, looking at the title itself, how beautiful the title is, right? Silent Spring. It seems to be, uh, to me, it reads like poetry. Hmm? And, uh, you know, at this juncture, I would also like to thank uh, Kalyani Man once again, because she's the one who introduced me to this book. Uh, I don't know if you remember that, ma'am. Uh, yeah, it was in 2012. You asked me to. Do you remember that? I do. I also introduced <laughs> you to Arabian Nights and a lot of yes, things. <laughs> yes, 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 of course, yes. Yeah, since that doesn't come in this context, I did not mention that. Yeah, but the silent spring, uh, I heard about this for the first time from ma'am. So ma'am asked me to write a short piece um, for the test newsletter. Uh, on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of Silent Spring, that was the book came out in 1962 and uh, 2012 was the 50th anniversary. And Mama asked me to write on it. She gave me one week's time and I managed to read things and wrote, wrote a short piece. Uh, but it was a very um, enlightening reading because it also gave me ideas later. Um, at that time, you know, things don't click to us on the spot, right? Thing It takes time, it, it settles down deep inside and sometimes suddenly 
uh, this epiphany happens that, oh, yeah, I, I could probably work on this. So like that, um, uh, Silent Spring stayed with me. Uh, and then um, some time later, uh, I got research ideas and uh, I, I, you know, I went on to uh, work on Barbara King Solver and Silent Spring uh, has been a very important uh, reference point in my thesis too. So, um, yeah, so uh, what's special about Silent Spring? Um, and uh, who is Rachel Carson? Right? Rachel Carson, is she a literature person? No. If she was, we would have known, right? She uh, was not, she's not, a, she is a writer. She was a writer, but she was not primarily a literature person, although she loved reading books and all that. She uh, was a marine biologist and she, um, she worked with the U.S. Fisheries Department, and uh, she used to uh, write a lot about the um, about uh, uh, the underwater life. She has a book. Uh, she has a collection called the Sea Trilogy, and she used to give radio talks and all. She was very popular. Um, now, when Silent Spring was published, it became uh, very famous and also very controversial because it spoke about uh, the hazardous impact of uh, chemicals and pesticides, especially DDT. Uh, now, um, I think Guha is, uh, yeah, in, in Guha's Global Environment History, he talks about the importance of chemicals in post-war America. Chemicals was everywhere, you know, even in uh, the, you know, anything you buy, sorry, it's not from, um, it's not from Guha's book, it's from another book by, uh, by Michael Pollan, who talks about food, basically. So uh, he talks about uh, this, um, you know, um, supermarket food, wherever you go and whatever you pick from the supermarket, supermarket, there is this high fructose corn syrup and a lot of other chemicals. So he talks about the, how there is a connection between um, post-war um, America's huge prosperity in um, in uh, business, in, you know, so there, there was a lot of chemicals that, I mean, um, even during the time of the war, America was uh, progressing and becoming very prosperous, right? It was slowly rising to be a, a superpower uh, uh, while uh, the British Empire was collapsing, right? So it uh, ba basically, it had a lot of uh, chemicals, um, chemical uh, production uh, for the sake of war, right? For the sake of making weapons. So all that chemicals, uh, you know, after the war, uh, they they still continue to make weapons and so on, but then a lot of this chemical industry was in um, was one of the major booming uh, sectors of American uh, economy, and um, uh, they were very powerful and influential in the government as well. So when Rachel Carson said, you know, she very powerfully wrote about the impact of chemicals, uh, it drew the wrath of uh, the chemical industry. Now uh, imagine uh, a book on chemicals and its impact becoming popular. Can you even think about it? Would you, if, if somebody gave you a 200 page book on impact of DDT, a scientific report, uh, you might read two pages, three pages. After that, it might it might become a little boring unless one is so much into chemistry, right? So, um, but what is different about Silent Spring is that it, it's the uh, power of words, it's the power of narrative and the power of storytelling and the images that she uses. So the first chapter of this book, famously called as the fable, a fable for tomorrow, talks about a, a, an imaginary town uh, where uh, the reference to silence is coming from there. Okay? Uh, a, a, a town that has become silent, a spring season uh, that is silent. Usually spring season is, uh, you know, uh, one can imagine a uh, colorful, vibrant life with a lot of birds chirping and birds flying around, butterflies. You know, it's a beautiful uh, image that comes into your mind when you think of spring. But here is a silent spring where there are no flowers, there are no birds, no bees, nothing, because all of them have died. How? Because of the impact of DDT, not directly, right? Because DDT seeps into the soil, the food cycle, it seeps into everything. So if birds and animals can die, Tomorrow we will die as well. Humans will die as well. So what major difference did the story make uh, in the people is suddenly the realization that um, man and nature are not separate anymore. It was never separate. It was just those uh, literary narratives that gave the impression that man and nature are separate. Here is something uh, where, you know, you won't even imagine the, the, you know, the long... Um, impact or the deep impact of chemical that can have on 
not only your generation, but for generations to come. Think of the Bhopal tragedy, think of uh, the nuclear disaster, right? So it is a very, very important concern. People started realizing that because of the power of words, let me reiterate that. So um, uh, uh, later on, when we talk about environmental humanities, uh, I will be reiterating this point where uh, communicating about the environmental disasters, you know, making people aware is a very uh, difficult task. Scientists have, uh, Amitabh Ghosh says that scientists have uh, not really been successful in doing this, you know, and therefore, literature and uh, other allied arts have to uh, uh, have to join hands with science in taking this forward. You know? And that is the importance of the discipline of humanities. Okay, coming back to silence. So this was one of the um, reasons uh, for the for propelling the modern environmental movement in America. And it, the book got translated into many, many languages and uh, it just, um, took off. So uh, apart from this reason, there were also several other reasons in the 1960s. 60s, uh, as you know, was a very vibrant period. A lot of changes were happening. So what were the other things? There was the fear of nuclear disasters, you know, Cold War was going on. Um, there was the problems of environmental pollution everywhere. Uh, there was uh, worries about population explosion and the resource crisis, you know, shortage of resources. Uh, so the uh, book came out around that time called the population bomb. You know, how, how can you relate these two words? Look at the imagery again, population bomb. Uh, what will happen if population just explodes and then you know, you're short of resources, you can't get food and so on. So that is a kind of um, worry that was there. This book is by Paul Elrich, uh, Population Bomb, 1968. Uh, there was also the energy crisis in the 1970s. So if you look at some of these environmental history books, you will see pictures where um, all these petrol stations, petrol pumps are shut down. There's long um, row of cars parking because they're all uh, short of fuel. And then suddenly this thing dawned upon people that, you know, we need to conserve energy. So um, they will uh, be very careful about switching on lights and, uh, you know, not using the AC and so on. So this energy crisis that, uh, you know, fuels are not uh, there, going to be there forever. So uh, then there was the moon mission, Apollo, and uh, NASA's uh, publishing of the image, of the beautiful image of planet Earth. Uh, it's called the blue marble. Uh, if you just Google that image and see it's very, very beautiful. The, for the first time, you know, uh, we saw the, you know, how, how does Earth look from the space. So we are part of the Earth and we don't actually get an idea of how it is. We, we take things very... Um, we take things for granted, right? So this image called the blue marble, um, you see that empty, vast expanse, the infinite space, the dark, infinite, abysmal space, which uh, that blue dot is hanging or it's just floating. You don't know. It could just sink. You you never know. It's vulnerable. It's fragile. So Earth is fragile. That notion is um, uh, the, uh, the uh, image of the blue planet blue marble uh, gave that sense of uh, you know vulnerability so uh, the uh, i mean by talking about all of these things the long and short of it is that environmental consciousness and environmental movements had all, all, always been there and they preceded the theorizations about the environment so um, now after this i get to the emergence of the discipline of eco criticism uh, what we see here is, uh, I mean, a long set of definitions. Maybe I can skip if you're getting bored with the definitions. Uh, but I will just uh, introduce you to some of the important names and books that maybe you can refer to if you're interested. So the term eco-criticism was first used by William Rukert in an essay uh, called Literature and Ecology, an Experiment in Eco-Criticism. It was published in 1978. You see, the term eco-criticism uh, is used for the first time in 1978 only, but we've been talking about nature and environment in various contexts already for such a long time. Okay? And he gives a very simple definition of uh, eco-criticism. He says that it is the application of ecology and ecological concepts to the study of literature. Now that was new, because till then we've already, uh, we were talking about, you know, Rachel Carson spoke about uh, DDT and all of that. So it's 
it was purely sciences, but then she, sto she said that in a story form in the first chapter, right? So here is the application of ecology and ecological concepts to the study of literature. It comes to the domain of literary studies then. Um, later in 1996 comes the very first uh, compiled uh, reader called uh, the Eco-Criticism Reader, Landmarks in Literary Ecology. And this is a compiled edited work uh, of you know, uh, essays that were published uh, much earlier. So in fact, William Rupert's essay is uh, published in, uh, I mean, the copy that I accessed is uh, published in this reader. And uh, this was in 1996. So that is the first time when uh, it's becoming like a serious discipline in the academia. That's why I said in the beginning that eco-criticism um, uh, as a discipline uh, came in, I mean, it, it emerged in the American universities. So uh, Glott Felty, interestingly, talks about three phases of the uh, evolution of, uh, uh, of um, eco-criticism, uh, very much in, uh, you know, along the lines of how Eileen Schuwalter talks about the evolution of feminism phases, right? So similarly, Glott Felty also says that, uh, how do we uh, apply eco-criticism to liter literature? First, we look for the stereotypical representation of nature in literature. Uh, in Leo Marx's example, we saw how American space, I mean, the place and the natives are represented in, uh, in as pristine nature or as hideous wilderness. So represent, stereotypical representation is one way of looking at it. Second thing is to re uh, recover nature writing text. So there could be some narratives that are long forgotten that needs to be revived and brought back to discussion and so on. So that is the second phase. Third phase is developing theoretical frameworks. So um, that comes much later. So um, moving on to another book, uh, Greg Garrard in his um, tiny but very uh, informative and important book, Introduction to Eco-Criticism. Uh, he organ it's a very interesting book. He organizes his chapters around the tropes and themes um, around which nature is discussing literature. So again, he talks about Arcadia, wilderness, Apocalypse, apocalypse. You think of all of those science fiction novels where this um, this dread of some futuristic threat is there, right? So the idea of apocalypse, the world is going to end, and then you know aliens are coming and so on. So nature is depicted in apocalyptic terms also. Then the idea of dwelling, and then uh, the idea of human animal um, interaction and so on. And he also introduces the different positions within within eco criticism, different positions and different strands of discourses such as the first word he calls is environmentalism. Now, we think of environmentalism as a broad term, right? But what he means as environmentalism is the idea of mainstream environmentalism that developed in the 1960s post Silent Spring. Um, and uh, why does he call mainstream? Because it, um, it, uh, it is white centric. It catered to rich people, elites, you know, people who have the uh, leisure to go to uh, the, you know, who join the Sierra Club. Sierra Club is associated with John Muir, you know, that walking guy. Uh, John Muir started the Sierra Club, and all these rich people, you know, they would want to go and enjoy the weekends in the wilderness. So mainstream environmentalism was that. After that came other uh, uh, strands like deep ecology, which is a little more philosophical. Uh, in in deep, deep Ecology is popularized by this Norwegian philosopher called Arne Nys. Arne Nys, um, um, he propounded this idea that we have a very human-centric approach to nature. You know? Remember the idea of conserve, uh, uh, utilizing nature for, tim for timber and uh, other purposes, exploiting nature. We have a very human-centered approach, like, a, you know, like, like we are the dominant species and we have the right to exploit nature and so on. He said he critiques that anthropocentrism, and he proposes that we need to have a biocentric uh, approach to nature. Biocentric approach would mean uh, that uh, you know there is an, everything in nature has an intrinsic value, but not in the sense of those preservationists. Okay, where that is also human centric because that is being preserved for humans to visit and enjoy. Here he says that uh, um, humans, just like humans non-humans, animals, plants, nature, everything has an intrinsic value and humans are only one among the many species in creation. Humans are not the dominant species, right? So that is deep ecology. Then you have ecofeminism, which is a feminist reading of nature. And it argues that, you know, patriarchal society and its values have resulted in 
the oppression of both women and nature. So there's some kind of an equating, uh, uh, you know, that is happening between women and nature. It's a very essentialistic idea that, you know, women, uh, is, uh, women are you know, nurturers and givers and all of that. But later eco-feminist, um, Greta Gard. Greta Gard, the first, uh, the, her initial writings are uh, more in favor of essentialist uh, approach. But later on, she corrected herself and said that, you know, uh, we, we have to move beyond these essentialist notions of uh, ecofeminism. Uh, and it is not always right to equate women uh, with nature in, in essentialist terms. One can think of other ways in terms of women's labor in nature, you know, um, uh, later, uh, you know, uh, Bina Agarwal in the Indian context talks about uh, environmental feminism or feminist environmentalism as opposed to ecofeminism, where she's talking about working class women and indigenous women, especially who has to um, who have to go long ways to uh, draw water from a well or a pond, or you know, they have to go to the forest to uh, to gather the firewoods and so on. So there is that kind of a labor related thing um, that women have to do in nature. So that is again different. So even uh, each of these strands have, uh, you know, a lot of different subdivisions and sub ideologies within them. Uh, another very important uh, area that I'm personally interested in is environmental justice uh, or environmental, environmental justice and environmental racism. So what does uh, this uh, do? Yeah, uh, Bridget, yes, we can take questions and then uh, they can start posing questions in your chat box. I will take the questions later. Yeah, I uh, I will. Uh, are we running out of time or something? I will. Uh, uh, not actually, but uh, we can, you know, take questions as well. Yeah, 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 sure. We can continue, ma'am, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So in environmental justice, they talk about the risks and burdens that marginalized communities suffer. So what do I mean by the risks and burdens? One example is, one very prominent example in American context is uh, something called the Love Canal incident. Now, Love Canal sounds very romantic, right? It sounds beautiful, uh, but it is, you won't, uh, I mean, you won't be able to associate it with a waste dump. Can you call a waste dump a Love Canal, right? So it is a canal that is used for dumping toxic chemical wastes. Um, and um, uh, this place is located in a working class neighborhood. So people in that locality, uh, you know, after a point of time started having uh, a lot of serious uh, skin diseases and other diseases, cancer and so on. So uh, then they started protesting for, you know, closing this down, uh, the, the waste dump site. It is, it's a very relatable thing, right? We hear about it all across the country. Um, yeah, so that is what uh, the environmental justice movements talk about. So they say that, you know, uh, uh, some uh, class of people enjoy the benefits of beautiful environment, whereas all the dirt and all the waste go to some other part uh, where, uh, you know, some other class of people suffer, right? You can think about a, uh, the spaces in your cities, in your region. Look at all the beautiful places in the class of people that enjoy fresh air and fresh, you know, a lot of uh, greenery. Um, and uh, look at the other, uh, the underbelly of the city or the, you know, the uh, suburbs and the rural and, or the remote areas of the city where there are slums. Um, there is a clear ca class aspect to it. Uh, in fact, in coming to the question of India, there is a caste aspect as well, which I'll be talking about a little later. So that is what env the environmental racism, environmental justice, uh, all of these movements talk about. So these theorizations were happening in the 80s, right? But uh, as I said before, uh, the uh, movements were already taking place um, separate from what is happening in the academia. Um, yes. Um, now coming to, uh, very quickly, I will take you through some of the uh, waves of eco-criticism. Earlier, we spoke about the environmental consciousness, uh, consciousness and the two broad waves of that that Guha talks about. Here, we come to the waves of eco-criticism, uh, where um, scholars like Lawrence Buell, his, uh, of his famous works are uh, the environmental imagination and uh, the future of eco-criticism. So uh, he, he talks about some waves of eco-criticism. Then he has also written an article with Ursula Hayes. Uh, she also um, uh, 
and Scott Slovic is another scholar who talks about the waves of ecocriticism. So they say, they uh, think about the kind of uh, topics that ecocritics eco engage with and uh, the um, you know, pro progress of uh, uh, the progress and the inclusion of newer topics uh, into um, uh, eco-critical studies. So the first thing that they noticed is that in the late 80s to about mid 90s, uh, eco-critics looked at nature writing, wilderness writing mainly, uh, and they were mainly non-fictional. So you can again relate to the you know uh, uh, the accounts about visiting national parks and these wilderness areas and so on. So it was mainly uh, non-fictional and mainly in the uh, American context because we're talking about um, emergence of the discipline in America. Um, yes, uh, the second uh, wave happened somewhere in the mid of the 1990s, uh, around 95, and uh, the focus here is ecofeminism and uh, environmental justice. So uh, thinking of, uh, you know, in comparison with the previous wave, what is happening here is nature is not looked at as a separate entity, as a separate spa space, like an empty space but it is interlinked with people, it is interlinked with culture, and the impact of nature on the people uh, is the focus here. So when I talk about these waves, they are not. it's not as if, you know, uh, when the second wave started, the first wave ended. It is not that. It is all progressive, progressing, and just newer strands are being added to the uh, uh, to eco-critical studies. So in the second wave, again, Mm, they move beyond the American context. They look at uh, um, indigenous writing, like, multicultural uh, context as well. Uh, after 2000, that is the third wave, where uh, you know um, globalization has already happened and the impact of uh, the the focus is on place, right? And the place would mean a local space, a regional space, as opposed to the overarching national narratives, which was the focus in the wilderness thing. Right? So this overarching national narratives as uh, national parks and the idea of the nation and the wild and all of that is not here. You look at here, uh, we're looking at uh, local spaces and how are they impacted by the global. So, for example, the idea of climate change comes into play here. Uh, you know, uh, it, the climate change, although it's a global phenomena, the way it is impacting each of these places are local specific, I mean, not local specific, are in different ways, right? So... Um, that is one of the examples there, the cause and effect, etc. are discussed in this space. Post-2008 is where the fourth wave begins. And here, you know, ecocritism expands further into uh, applied uh, ecocritism and practical ecocritism, where, you know, the idea of ecology is applied not just to the sciences, which was the case earlier, not just in literature, which was a, the case with early ecocriticism, but here it is practically being applied and extended to almost all walks of life. Like food and ecology is one area, uh, health and ecology is one area, consumerism, how is our consumerism being, um, you know, impacting ecology. So always when I think of consumerism and ecology, I think of this uh, brown bag that you get at the shopping malls. And um, I don't remember which, um, you know, which brand gives that, or I don't know if everyone gives that. The brown bag has this tag saying, there is no planet B. Yeah, so, so uh, I mean, it's a very important uh, idea, but then just by writing that and just by looking at it once and then buying and going, um, is is that uh, is that uh, mindful consumption? Or, uh, I mean, uh, I would think of it as a very superficial idea of um, uh, thinking or worrying about ecology. Uh, consumerism and capitalism has deeper impacts on uh, ecology, which all of these superficial uh, things just gloss over. Okay, so consumerism and ecology, the idea of sustainable development, resource utilization, et cetera, comes into play here. These are all examined through eco-critical perspective and definitely in the context of how they are being, uh, they are impacting people uh, and uh, vice versa, how people are also impacting all of this. So uh, through these waves, what we see is that from the traditional approach of looking at literature through ecology, we are moving beyond literature into many, many other spaces, other disciplines, uh, like you, know, you think of sciences, history, geography, philosophy, sociology, anthropology, all of that come into play, climate studies, regional studies, population studies, etc. So uh, we do not uh, we do not look at literature alone, uh, but uh, we are looking at um, we we are basically taking a cultural studies point of view uh, to understand the interweaving 
collisions between um, between uh, environment and many other disciplines. And moving on from this Euro-American context, one can think of the post-colonial and indigenous ecocriticism. So there is this book called uh, Post-Colonial Ecocriticism by um, our post-colonial people. Um, uh, not getting that name. Gra Graham Hagen and uh, um, Helen Dippen. Yeah, Helen Dippen. Yes. So that is a very interesting book. You can take a look at that. And then there is our very own Ramchandra Guha. Um, I mentioned about this article, the Third World Environmentalism, American Environmentalism. He has also written a couple of other books. Uh, you know, in collaboration with other scholars. So he has this other book called Varieties of Environmentalism, uh, Perspectives from Global North and Global South. So that idea, that di distinction um, that, you know, uh, environment, the impact of environment or, you know, environmental degradation, etc., is not uniform and homogenous all across the globe. It is different, like I said earlier, in the case of the local and the local being affected by the global. Um, there are so many other factors that come into play here, and uh, we are all not standing on the same and equal plane. Um, Amita Ghosh also uh, brings that point in this book, uh, The Great Derangement, where he says that, you know, when we are talking about, um, you know, a responsibility for uh, reducing the time, uh, carbon emissions, you know, we cannot think of the first world and third or the global north and global south in the same uh, plane because the global north has, uh, you know, especially you, Europe and America, um, have imperial countries have benefited from imperialism and colonialism, whereas the developing world has started their journey towards development only after decolonization. So you cannot tell the developing world that you that you are emitting carbon, you cannot you should not get developed and so on. So there is definitely that distinction between the global north in the context of the global north and global south. Uh, Guha talks about it, Amita Ghosh talks about talks about it. And this is also very interesting with the great derangement, um, where he talks, this is a 2015 book. 15 or 16. So he talks about climate change and um, so the book is uh, The Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable. So what is this derangement that he's talking about? He is basically critiquing uh, writers, you know, literary uh, authors who um, might engage with socio-political uh, cultural things and everything as a backdrop for their uh, work, but not, uh, not necessarily um, uh, nature does not, I mean, nature in the sense like climate change does not uh, prominently figure in a lot of uh, literature, mainstream literature. So, uh, but then he himself moved on uh, from that and then he went on to write the Gun Island uh, So he, he does talk about environmental uh, problems, uh, but yeah, he says that uh, literature should be able to um, take the question of climate change uh, as one of the primary uh, issues um, rather than as a passing uh, backdrop, right? So um, this was another book. Then there is there are these two books by uh, Guha and Madhav Gargil. Uh, this is called The Fissured Land, An Ecological History of India and uh, Ecology and Equity, The Use and Abuse of Nature in Contemporary India. So uh, they're talking about a lot of colonial policies, forest policies here, the conflict between the natives and um, the notion of um, resource distribution and so on. And uh, they have this concept called, you know, they divide the Indian population in three categories broadly based on their access to natural resources. So they say that uh, there is, um, uh, uh, they, there are the ecosystem people by which they mean that people who live near, um, uh, say, uh, near hilly areas or near uh, rivers or near uh, or uh, you know in the coastal areas people who are very close to um for uh, because of the close proximity of uh inhabiting uh, these spaces near, close to nature then they talk about omnivores omnivores are uh, people who um, exploit these natural spaces and um as a result what happens is that these ecosystem people are um ecosystem people are um sort of uh, evacuated from their place or they're affected in some way or the other and they become ecological refugees. So that is the third category that they talk about. Ecosystem people, omnivores and ecological refugees. And in this case, I mean, you just think about any environmental issue in the country. Um, 
be it chipko or nba na, the narmada bacha andolan which are like very prominent uh, movements uh, but then in every part of the country you think of your own spaces your own regions you will find many many examples where uh, the ecosystem people have been um, affected and they became ecological refugees right and then there is this concept called slow violence um, by uh, rob nixon it's a very important book especially from um, uh, you know the perspective of the marginalized people from an env environmental justice perspective uh, and uh, especially when you think about development and environment because a lot of people are becoming affected by this right development is of course um, needed for a every country but it has to be inclusive to their development right so uh, rob nixon says that many of the cases are um, like when you think of Bhopal uh, tragedy or um, think of pollution itself or think of any kind of uh, toxic um, pollution. Uh, we spoke about the Love Canal incident, right? We, we can think of many such um, incidents that we are familiar with from our own spaces. So what happens is the impact of that pollution is not felt at the moment. Uh, it's not visible immediately, but then it is, uh, it's incremental. It keeps on adding and maybe 10 years down the line, suddenly you realize that, you know, people got cancer and this was the reason for that. So it's incremental. So he calls this, uh, you know, this thing as slow violence. It is not tangible. It is not visible, but then it is slowly beating you up. Right. So um, he said he also has this concept called development refugees, people who become, uh, you know, the, uh, as a result of uh, development, as a result of you know, the, it's again related to the unfair distribution of risks and benefits. Some people enjoy the benefits and some people are always pushed to suffer the risks. Right. And um, we spoke a lot about uh, Guha, but then uh, one uh, problem with Guha is, you know, when I was reading this book again for this talk, I mean, I uh, read it uh, some time back, uh, but then I was rereading again, I found a lot of uh, problems in his language, in the sense is, he goes so gaga about Gandhi, and um, in fact, there's even one point where he says Gandhi is a Hindu thing, so, so um, yeah, he's all about, you know, Gandhi being the great um, uh, patron saint of environment, and that's the place he uses in one of his a patron saint of environmentalism, as if environmentalism does, did not exist before Gandhi. Uh, yeah, Gandhi did have a certain idea of um, nature and economy, rural economy, and uh, his perspective about the villages and so on. But then, uh, you know, you uh, one important thing that Gandhi uh, refuses to talk about is the question of caste, right? So this book called Caste and Nature by Mukul Sharma, uh, at one point, he critiques uh, Gandhian perspective, and he says that, you know, this idea of romanticizing the village as opposed to the city, a very Wordsworthy and very, um, it's an idea that Gandhi himself derives from English romantics. So uh, that kind of a city, a city and um, countryside uh, demarcation is not very easily applicable in the context of India, because he, Gandhi, uh, conveniently, or maybe not, um, uh, you know, forgets to look at the issue of caste, right? And one can just think about the question of, um, I mean, the uh, the incident that Ambedkar was refused to drink water from uh, the well, right? Which means the spaces in the villages are uh, demarcated by caste. Not all spaces in the village is accessible to everyone, right? So um, village is, uh, that way, is not a very pristine and happy place. Uh, there are, you know, casteist exploitation and all of that. So the way, uh, the, you know, uh, all people, uh, uh, you know, their access to resources is not the same uh, in the village or the city. So that is one critique of Gandhi that you can see in uh, Mukul Sharma's book, uh, Caste and uh, Nature. Then uh, moving on, uh, there is also this paper uh, called A Survey of the Faces of Indian Criticism by Rayson K. Alex, where he um, uh, he gives an account of how he has been teaching eco-criticism, the course of eco-criticism in the university. And he says that, you know, we are all, I mean, even in my talk, uh, more than half of it, I was talking about the Euro-American context, even though I did not want to make it Euro-American centric, right? So there is a heavy West load of this Western influence and Western tradition that we talk about. We need to have a, uh, you know, more of a, a 
more importance to the regional uh, perspective, regional approach to Indian eco-criticism. Uh, that's what uh, Alex argues for. And he says that eco-criticism can very mm, actively engage in questions of land, ethnicity, sustainability, uh, poverty, um, caste, water policies, etc. within a region. Right. So with that, I mean, I would, um, uh, I, I thought I will uh, you know, slowly move on to the context of Kerala because uh, I am from there and, you know, I, uh, I thought a lot of students would be from there. But then I don't want to restrict it to Kerala. I want it to, um, I want all of you to think about the uh, context of environment in your own cities and regions. So uh, just to give some um, examples from Kerala, you know, there was this very, very famous uh, environmental conservation, nature conservation movement uh, called the SAFE. Sorry about the noise. Um, Okay, so uh, the safe silent valley movement. Uh, so mm -hmm. elsewhere, I'm so sorry, they're not my dogs. It's just a territorial fight. So, uh, so safe silent valley movement. It was uh, in the uh, 80s, and in uh, that movement, uh, I mean, a dam was um, commissioned to be built in the silent valley uh, forest, and then uh, a lot of uh, activists and writers and all came to the front uh, for you know. And it was a major movement that was taken up by the civil society, and they were successful in their protest um, to such an extent that they could, uh, you know, uh, cancel. I mean, the project had to be cancelled, right? The, the construction of the dam did not happen, and the place was also um, announced as a, a, a reserve forest, and conservation uh, was ensured. Now, um, uh, hi, ma'am. Uh, yes. Sorry to disturb. <laughs> sorry to interrupt. Yes. So, uh, uh, sorry to tell. Uh, we need to uh, wind up by seven forty-five. So, uh, sure, sure. will it be okay will... to take some questions? Sure, uh, sure. I will just uh, make one more point and uh, conclude it. I mean, please, ma'am. Please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, that was in the nineteen eighties. If you think of so many other movements that happened after two thousand, and uh, with the latest movements like Kerala and William, you see where do the civil society stand and where do the ecosystem eco eco Ecological refugees of Guha and Gargil stand, right? There's no civil society to take that up. There are there are no poets and writers and activists to take that up. So yeah, so that is the state of our political ecology now. Um, and especially at the time when Kerala has become even much more vulnerable after uh, the floods of 2018 and 19 and many, many landslides that are happening every year, right? And after this point, I also wanted to uh, talk a little bit about the possible research areas that people could um, look into if interested. So you can pro probably look at the environmental narratives in popular culture. So, uh, you know, for example, there's this rap song on Kodai Canal. There are rap, rap songs about environment uh, uh, conservation and so on. Um, one can look into climate fiction, Anthropocene studies, animal studies, place studies, medical environmental humanities, digital environmental humanities, and so on. So, yeah, I hope uh, you all found this um, talk useful. And then I hope uh, you'll be able to um, you know, explore further. Thank you. And sorry about exceeding the time. I myself did not think that it was so long. Yes, over to you, Bridget. No, ma'am. It's beautiful to listen and hear. Uh, uh, should I read the questions? Or? Yeah, yeah, you can. Uh, so happy to see all the questions. Uh, or uh, Coil, can you can you do it? Uh, hello, Brigitte. Actually, yes, yes. I am not at home. Will you please continue? Okay, I'll, 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 I'll do it. No problem. No. Thank you. Ma'am, uh, uh, I'm not sure we can take all the questions, but uh, we can take some. Uh, so, uh, there are some questions. Okay. Uh, I would like to ask that uh, can be the possible solutions for maintaining the city life and countryside life. The fact that modernization and development is also necessary for growth, but in terms of ecological sense uh, can be one. It's about the maybe globalization and you know urbanization and environmental issues. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh... 
so like uh, we cannot go back to an idea that was old and pristine because uh, from Mukul Sharma's uh, uh, critique of Gandhi's uh, notion of city life, we know even the village is not that, uh, you know, like how we used to see in our uh, movies of the 80s and 90s. It's not that green and beautiful and, you know, where everything is peaceful. There is exploitation even in the village. So it's a myth that village does not have exploitation and it's a very peaceful place. One. Second thing is the idea of growth and development has to be inclusive. Uh, if it can bring in opportunities for all, uh, it's great. Uh, but then it is an um, it is something that has to be done with the um, uh, in consultation with the locals uh, where any kind of development project is uh, you know being implemented. So the people uh, and their uh, uh, view of life and development also have to be taken into account. They, uh, you know, if a, a large chunk of the people are asked to leave their homes and, you know, fend for themselves in future, that is not um, an ideal scene of development. Yeah. Even, uh, thank you for that. Uh, even I remember my plus two class when we, you know, uh, read and studied that fable, you know, uh, that particular chapter you mentioned. Oh, you studied uh, in plus two. Yes, yes. <laughs> Uh, another question, uh, what are the difference between eco-criticism and eco-feminism? Yeah, so eco-criticism is the broad area where uh, application of ecological concepts to the study of literature is being done. And in eco-feminism eco is one of the strands, uh, you know, one type of eco-critical study where you also look into the feminist uh, debates um, and a look at how there is the exploitation of women and the exploitation of nature by um, androcentric and anthropocentric measures. Okay. Uh, even I, I think, you know, most of the ecological movements led by, you know, famous women, even in Mailama in Kerala and, you know, uh, what, what happened in uh, all over the India. Another question, how, uh, you know, can internet and technology act as a way out for environmental problems? Definitely. Technology. So, yes. yes. Definitely. So that is the last point I think that I mentioned here, the um, coming together of digital humanities and environmental humanities. I know people who are doing excellent work in this area where, you know, they work um, along with indigenous communities to build a digital platform to showcase uh, the uh, you know, the culture or the struggles or their narratives. So uh, instead of, you know, um, a writer or a researcher taking the uh, the the you know, coming to the front seat, coming to the foreground to talk about the community. Here you see the community itself participating in projecting their life. So yes, digital platform is definitely a very useful and uh, you know more accessible and communicatable uh, medium to talk about environmental uh, issues. So one can think of the platform called Pari archives of rural India uh, and uh, you know yeah a lot of platforms are there like that where uh, I mean in the digital platform you can embed oral narratives you can embed documentaries you can embed folk songs a lot of things can be portrayed um, and it is more uh, easy to access for the for academic as well as non-academic audience. Also uh, the spectrum of eco-criticism in folk tales is very diverse maybe connected with your uh, previous. Uh, can you just talk about the concept of eco-Gothic? Okay. Um, I, I have not read much on that area, but I can just, uh, uh, I mean, you all know what is Gothic literature, right? The sense of eeriness and fear and uh, some kind, kind of gloom and doom and all is there. So uh, there is a related area that I am familiar with that is eco-phobia. Uh, that is, you know, in the context of uh, how uh, the environmental disasters and all are happening, how do you look at nature, how do you uh, understand that fear of uh, nature or how, like, is nature, like, for example, if there's tsunami, uh, the sea is not calm all the time, right? The sea could any time become a, few, a very uh, monstrous this shape. So um, engaging with nature uh, in its... Uh, monstrous dimension is something uh, that will fall under the area of ecophobia. Again, within ecophobia, there is no one specific definition for that. There are you know, multiple ways in which people interpret fear and people interpret uh, interpret different kind of uh, ecological danger. So, yeah. Yes, ma'am. 
Um, I think uh, I, I covered almost questions. I'm okay. skipping some questions, uh, no problem. So um, you can give a final word now, please. We will move to the water. Uh, do I need to say anything? Uh, if you had something to, you know, okay. say. no, no, it was just, uh, I mean, um, I enjoyed the session. It was really, um, I mean, a, a great opportunity. Thank you again, uh, ma'am. Um, and I, I'm, you know, I want to, uh, go through all the previous lectures and keep learning from you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you, ma'am. Ma Thank you, And Shailesh, please come on the stage to be both of them. Yes, yes ma'am. Happy environmental friendly evening, everyone. It's such a privilege to be part of this imposing event, ma'am. As a representative of the I would be delighted to extend my wholehearted gratitude to our dignified guest, Dr. Rajita, ma'am. Honestly, bunch of thanks to you, ma'am, for uprising us with your wide knowledge on this adequate field of uh, environmental studies with a connection to literature that unwrap various concepts for learners like us. It is such a privilege to listen to you, ma'am, throughout the session. We would definitely look forward to gather more from you, ma'am, in the upcoming discourses. We hope that uh, you would like it too, ma'am. And now I would love to thank with all sincerity to the veteran of Wallace stage, Dr. Kalyani Wallace, ma'am, who is behind our all enthusiasm, and to my CSRF team, and also to our whole team, test. A wide round of applause and thanks to all the participants who made the event a memorable one. And I would li uh, like to thank all of you present here for making the time to be with us today and helping us make this event a grand success. Thank you, one and all. Now it's time to conclude today's session. Have a great evening ahead. See you and keep learning. And never forget the motto of our, our wellness, the best is yet to be.